Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. You know My it. name is Talmadge Heflin. I'm the director of the Center for Fiscal Policy at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. We're glad you're with us here today to talk about some form of school finance or money in the classroom and who all, you know, whatever else we want to talk about, about education. Uh, I want to point out to those of you who um, are looking for continuing education credits. Uh, the State Bar has certified this particular panel uh, for credit. So if you, somewhere in the back of the room, there's a sheet to sign in to get those credits. If you don't sign that sheet, you won't get them. So uh, be sure that you run that down and sign to get the credits that you'll be uh, so deserving of after sitting through this big panel here on that. This week we're highlighting the Texas Prosperity Promise. Uh, it's our pledge to secure and extend Texas success through 2019 and beyond. It's more than a plan for the next legislative session. It's a commitment to the guiding values that are critical to keeping Texas prosperous and free. It's a promise to you and a promise to each other to protect and defend the Texas model of liberty and prosperity for years to come. We ask that you join this effort by visiting TexasProsperityPromise.com and sign the promise to keep fighting for freedom and our shared prosperity. Uh, we hope that you will uh, take part in that. Uh, we're behind schedule a little bit as we usually are when we have interesting speakers uh, along with our meals, so we'll be moving along. Uh, members, uh, panelists will be presenting in the order that they're seated. We we'll start out with Senator Larry Taylor who has to get to his uh, a meeting that he's responsible for since he had something to do with the legislation and the special session that created this panel to talk about funding public education. So he's gonna make his presentation and then he'll be uh, leaving. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the other panels will have to answer the hard questions that he would have gotten <laughs> great. On, that, on that. So uh, for but anyway, great position. <laughs> yeah. Before his election to the uh, Texas Senate in 2012, he served five terms in the Texas House. He currently serves as chairman of the Senate Committee on Education as a member of the Senate Finance, Business, and Commerce and Higher Education. He was appointed to the Texas Commission on Public School Finance, that's a meeting he's got to go to, which will explore ways to update and improve how Texas funds its schools. Also chairs the Joint Interim Committee to study a, a coastal barrier system which aims to identify methods of storm protection along the Gulf Coast. And a member of the Legislative Budget Board, a permanent joint committee responsible for de developing budget policy recommendations for legislative appropriation. <laughs> Robert Enlow, President and CEO of Ed Choice, before the establishment of Ed Choice in 2016, was an integral part of the Friedman Foundation for Educational Choice since its founding in 1996. Under his leadership, the Friedman Foundation, now Ed Choice, has become one of the nation's most respected and successful advocates for educational choice, working in dozens of states to achieve, to advance its vision by disseminating research, sponsoring seminars, undertaking advertising campaigns, uh, and or organizing community leaders, has served as private sector chairman of education task force for ALEC, a group uh, that has also recognized him as a member, uh, private sector member. Christy Rome, executive director of the Texas School Coalition, an organization that represents the interest of Chapter 41 school districts subject to the wealth equalization and must send Robin Hood payments to the state. Previously served as the director of the Intergovernmental Relations Policy Oversight for the Austin Independent School District. Experience also spans from serving in the classroom as a teacher, working within the Governmental Relations Division of the Texas Education Agency, and serving as a senior policy analyst in the Senate Committee on Education. She's a Baylor. Uh, University grad, Aaron Smith, education policy analyst at Reason Foundation. Prior to joining Reason was Senate, senior director of analytics at Yes Prep Public Schools, a nationally known 
a renowned charter management organization serving nearly 10,000 students. At YES was a <coughs> excuse me, founding member of the uh, analytics department and oversaw research, state accountability, and data management. Uh, was selected by the Charter School Association to serve on the Accountability Policy Advisory Committee for the state of Texas, where he worked with superintendents, uh, business executives, policy leaders, and others. Uh, we'll be talking about money in the classroom. Uh, members, our panelists are free to talk about what they want to as long as it deals with education. And quite frankly, I'm looking forward to a very spirited conversation about school funding. Senator. And y'all may know that of those 10 years I served in the House, I got to serve with Talon Heflin for a number of those years, and he was the chairman of the Finance Committee, so he's going to know a lot about what we're talking about. But some of this is going to go even further back than you, Talmadge. Um, <laughs> I really want to kind of set the stage. We're talking about school finance. That's a big discussion. We're at the School Finance Commission today. And there's a lot of things that are floated out there that I think it's important for people to know. In fact, I've learned things uh, going through this process that you know, I was not aware of, and I think most, most other people are not aware of either. Uh, kind of go back to where our school finance system started, 1854, before us, right, mm -hmm. Talmadge? Uh, sure. The common school law was passed, and we set up the permanent school fund. You know, they had some land back then. And they set it up with $2 million back in 1854. That was the permanent school fund, which was our endowment. And now in 1876, we, we set aside 45 million acres for the permanent school fund to help fund our schools. And from that point, for the most part, the state did not use general revenues to fund schools. It came out of those, those investments and off that endowment until 1989. It's pretty recent history. You know, a lot of people think that this was you know, the 50-50 split or whatever was handed down by Moses on a stone tablet, and, you know, this is the way school finance is supposed to be. But this is really a fairly recent phenomenon that the state has actually used general revenue to fund schools. In fact, there were a number of, you know, uh, Supreme Court tests, and we had 89 was Edgewood, the first one. You know, where we, had rule, we had to have some kind of equity. We had some real inequities out there at the time. I mean, some of the schools were getting, you know, several hundred percent more, 1,700 percent or more than some of the lower uh, schools. So it was very inequitable. But unfortunately, I think, you know, looking at it now and not knowing all the facts and everything at the time, but it, instead of bringing those that were at the very bottom up, we brought everybody up. And I think you'll see a lot of that. We had Supreme Court t uh, cases in 91 we lost, 92 we lost, 95 we, we won, but there were some things going on. Uh, all these things are called Band-Aids be put on our system. So our system started off in basically the 1940s or so, the current school finances, but then we had all these Supreme Court decisions, so we just kept putting Band-Aids on different people, different architects coming along trying to fix what had been uh, ruled unconstitutional. In 1999, the state first began being involved in facilities funding. 1999. So this is a pretty recent thing, right? I, I think we've all kind of forgotten these things so when you hear a lot of these things discussed, this is pretty recent history that we were even involved. Up till 1990, the local schools built all their schools, used bonds, and we started letting them use the permanent school fund as a backing for the bonds and those types of things. So, but I think if you look back at construction of schools prior to 99, and look at what construction of schools looks like today after 99, I think you'll see a marked difference. I think most of us went to school in buildings that were built before 1999. And you compare what your kids are going to school in today, it's a different world, is it not? I mean, I drive around some of these campuses, they look like college campuses. I mean, it's unbelievable. But anyway, so I think, you know, the state got involved in 99. 2003, we had another uh, Supreme Court ruling against us. 2005, another one against us. And that's when we came out in 2006, and we were here, I was here, when we literally cut your local property taxes by 50 cents. How many of you ever remember that? I'm going to show you here in a little bit why it didn't last very long. <laughs> but, but we cut it, 50 cents. The state increased their funding to make sure that we were funding these schools. They had latitude and flexibility within their funding, and we cut it by 50 cents, literally one-third of the M&O property tax rate in schools. That's a pretty substantial bump in state funding, would you not agree? Um, so anyway, we'll start with the slides here. And I don't normally use slides, so this is going to be kind of a foreign thing for me. I've even got a laser pointer. 
that I think I've already lost from Star no, Wars. Your, your, your guy's got it there somewhere. No, I've got the pointer. Got this the is going to be so cool. <laughs> yep, that's me. <laughs> uh, I'm just warming up. I've got to get used to this thing. Oh, yeah, okay. So here's our first slide. And what I want you to see, now these numbers starting in 2000, so we're going back, you know, 17, 18 years ago. Now these numbers, we're using PEMS data, PEMS versus budget. Now a lot of these discussion you hear on school finance, they talk about budget. How many of you work in organizations where you have a budget and you meet monthly and you look at your budget and what do you also look at? Actuals. What do you think is more important to look at? What you budgeted or what actually happened? These are what actually happened. Looking back, in fact, if you used budget data for 2017, 18, several years back, looking back, you know what you would leave out? Harvey. We all know what we, what we expect, expected to happen during this school year and what's happened during this school year are vastly different. So a lot of people talk about budget and they want to compare you know, what, had, what we had budgeted. Well, that has not, because the budget has never, ever, former budget chair, mm -hmm. has it ever been exactly what we budgeted? No. Has it been vastly different than what we budgeted? Mm -hmm. In fact, most of the time it is. So I think it's really important, if you're going to look at a historical record, let's look at the historical record, not what we budgeted, not what we hoped for, not what we dreamed. This is actual data. I think you'll see a pretty good trend line overall. In fact, it starts off here, um, get to my next page here. Well, back up the very first, first slide, here we go. Um, the cover page. Here. Wow, this is amazing. All right, see this little number? <laughs> this is total. Total spending for education in 2000 was $28 billion. I go over here, I can't read it, but it's like 50, 50, $58 billion, okay, over that period of time. And what's important here, and I've got 2007, 8, and 9 here. What does that number right there say? This is the local taxes in 2000, and it's 19. And what, hap what did I just tell you what happened in two th after the 2006? We, we increased state funding, cut local taxes by 50 cents, one-third, right? All right, so the next year, what's that number? All right, so there's drop, right? We increased, we cut their tax rate. Here's the shocker. Look at the next number. Your 50-cent tax cut was gone in two years. You basically had a one-year relief on the thing. So, I mean, look at the slope. Well, well, we'll see the slope here in a little bit, but that, that's an important thing because we keep hearing about we need to put more money in from the state, more money from the state. Well, we did that. We, we actually tried that, and, and I, I think we kind of messed up because we kind of left the door open. A lot of these new buildings you're seeing, a lot of them are growth. And, and don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to pick on people here, and I'm not accusing people, but we all voted for this. This is us. And when I look at this total, let's look at the total from 28 to 59. We talk about the split between local and state. Who pays local and state taxes? Everybody. So this idea of splitting and how we're splitting, and, and what I'm hearing from taxpayers is they're paying a lot of taxes. You all kind of hear that? I mean, there's a little pressure about you know, how we're spending so much money. So when you hear people talk about, hey, we've got to increase the state share, Tell me where it comes from. Um, I'm, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Let's go to the next slide here. This is the percentage breakdown between state and local. So the, it looks even at the top because it's 100%. So you, you already saw the growth. So the numbers are getting bigger. But this just shows who's paying what percentage. And in 2000, let me find a little, the state share was what? 44. 44. And what is it over there? So from 2000 to 2016, we backed the state. Because you pe keep hearing about these dramatic drops what the state share is. It's gone from 44 to 41, 40, 3 or 4 percent. Local has gone from 41 to, you'll have to tell me, I can't read it. 45. 41 to 45. So they've gone up 4 percent, we've gone down 3 or 4 percent. Not a huge swing, right? But look at it. From 2005, 
I mean, that's where we, we 2006, we, we, we increased it. You'll see our share go up substantially here. You can see it on the picture. So the state is not exactly falling behind in what they've done. We are keeping up, and we're, we're keeping up with, with st student growth. You know, in this budget that we're in right now, we're estimating student growth in Texas, 80,000 students a year. 80,000, think of that in terms of school districts. That's like Fort Worth ISD. We're adding every year. So to keep this funding level up, it's cost a lot of money. We're spending over a billion dollars a year just in growth. But last session, we, we, we did fund, fully fund the formulas. We fully funded growth. And so the state is, is doing its best on this thing. Um, but I just need you, to, need you to see that. Now, a lot of people keep hearing about this 38%, right? The state's share is down to 38%. They're not including all the numbers. They're not including all the state revenue. They're just talking about the foundation school program. We fund a lot of other things as well for education. So when you hear that 38%, that is not an accurate number. Here's the number according to PEAMS. This is actual data. Now, why does this stop at 2016? Because it's actual data. We're still getting in the numbers for 17. So when we have the 2017 numbers, we can update this. All right, then we can move to the next slide there. And I'll be just as surprised as you to see what it is, because I didn't have, I, didn't, I missed rehearsals. <laughs> <laughs> but this, but, so we've talked about what our growth has been. Total growth in spending, 61%. Student growth, enrollment, 20%. Over this period of time, this is from 2005. That's what the, and you hear about the states not keeping up their share, right? Look at the state's percentage growth, 82% from 2005 to 2016. What's the local share done? 50%. So when you hear these things, this is like 10 years worth of data, right? The state's not keeping up. We're up 82% and the locals are up 50%. Once again, we voted for these things and I'm not picking this, this share thing is, is not written in stone. This is something we, we fairly recently have started doing. But you see this right here, there's our little, our little one year dip in local. There's 2008 tax relief kicks in right here. So the state substantially bumps up their funding, which is up here. The locals dropped. And then look at that, here's, this is 2007, here's 2000, I'm sorry, seven, eight, where we really kicked in, that's our bigger, in 2009, we're right back here. It's almost like it's a bump in the road. See that? I just think this is important information to see to get the whole picture where we are. You know, once again, I just, I think it's good we start from a factual base because a lot of this stuff is repeated over and over and it's become the truth, right? Because you've heard it enough times that this is just, this is consensus, this is what we're doing. Is that my time? That's it. Well, that was fun. I want to thank you all for, I want to thank you all for coming. Let's see if there's anything else I really want to get real quick. Well, let me just say, well, let me just back up. I mean, just finish up here. The problem is, get me to that last slide. The very last one. There we are. This is an interesting chart. I, I, it looks like somebody just threw darts at it, but this is actually data that was given to us by Supreme Court Justice Craig Enix at our first school finance commission. And the point is, it's reinforcing. You see all these dots? These are, these are school districts. Those are all school districts. And this right here is the average spending the zero, these are those spending below the average, these are those spending above average. As you see, it gets way above average. This is the average performance, demographically adjusted. And I don't know how they do all that, that's well above my pay grade. But what do you notice here? Average, above average spending. Here's performance, what are you seeing? So spending more money, obviously the performance is no, that's not what's happening. So it is important how much you spend, right? But is it the most important thing? The most important thing is how you spend the money. And my goal and my, and my passion for public education is we have got to get more productivity out of our education dollar. I didn't have time to tell you about the budget, but I'll tell you real quick. Real quick pie chart. Everybody seen a pie chart? 12 to 6 is how much the state spends on public education in higher ed, 52% of our budget. So when you hear people say make education a priority, it is number one. 
It is 52% of our budget. You know what's next? Health and Human Services. In years past, Health and Human Services was from 6 to 8. Now, Health and Human Services is now approaching 6 to 10. It has grown dramatically. So you wonder where the money's going. Health and Human Services from 6 to 10. 10% is like public safety. So what does that leave you with for transportation, running government, all these things? So there's not a whole lot more money coming in. You know, people say we need more money. What they're saying is we need more taxes. And we may need a new tax because people don't want to pay higher sales tax because that puts an uncompetitive position in other states. We have got to get more productive. I'm going to wrap up, Talmud. I'm trying. <laughs> we can do this. We are in the technological age. This is the 21st century. You show me any business in this country that hasn't improved their, their uh, productivity, and if they haven't, they're not in business. We are in a global competitive market. Our, our state is doing well. We have demographic challenges in this state. We have 59% of our kids are economically disadvantaged. They cost more to educate. I get that. But there is technology and there are things out there that we can use to actually improve our education. The internet, online education resources are free versus buying a textbook for 90 bucks. One one electronic devices. We can reach these kids where they are today in the 21st century and give them a better education, but we've got to be willing to embrace change and moving forward and not standing here, standing on the status quo. The status quo is not getting it done. We are, we are well, we're getting better in Texas, but we're not getting better fast enough. The rest of the world is passing us by, and we're in a global competitive marketplace. We've got to step up. I'm going to leave it for the, the tough question for the rest of the crew, but I just want to kind of set the stage for you where we are and why we have to embrace moving forward using technology, teaching methods, self-paced education for our students, mastery, not just passing based on the amount of time. You got your grade, you get, you get to move on. We've got to have these kids better equipped for the 21st century because we don't even know what they're going to be doing. We have no idea. Ten years ago, we didn't know we were going to have a smartphone like we have today. And that technology curve is getting steeper and steeper every year. We've got to prepare these kids for the 21st century, not the 20th century like we grew up in. Thank you, Talmadge. I appreciate the time. Good morning, everyone. My name is Robert Enlow, and I am the president and CEO of Ed Choice. We're a national organization started originally by Milton Friedman. We have a simple vision. Uh, families should have full and unencumbered choice as a pathway to successful lives and a stronger society. Simple idea. People with more power and choice have better lives and we, our society is better. So how do I get to this school funding debate and conversation? Well, first of all, um, I am, I guess, representing, if you go to the senators, right, I'm representing the 10% that is the federal taxpayer in this room. Uh, so I'm com I come from Indiana, uh, but we're a national organization and I want to make a disclaimer. I am not a Texas school financing expert, although I did sleep at Hilton last night. Um, <laughs> but I am from Indiana, where we've done some amazing stuff, and I want to share with you what we've done. And I also want to talk to you a little bit about um, the need uh, and importance of, of data. I've been on a school board, so I understand how school districts work uh, very well, and how the, the power and money flow. And I also want to make sure you understand that uh, in a place like Indiana, this is one place where we've actually bested Texas. Um, you want to know how many times we've been sued for adequacy and e equity in our school system financing formula? Zero. Now, there's a reason for that, and I'm going to share that with you. But before we do that, I think one of the first things to do is to say, I'm usually working for PowerPoint, so I think there's sort of a switch going on. Larry's usually the opposite on PowerPoint. But um, I want to go through a thought exercise so you can get an idea of about how people are using money, how people think about this. So I got all this data from, from various websites last night, including your own. I want you to think here for a second that according to the TEA, that the highest class size number in the state of Texas is 20.8 for grade five. So 20.8 kids per class. Based on the data that your state reports to the National Center for Education Statistics, the per pupil revenue in 2014 and 15, the latest effective data they have, was 10,577 per pupil. That was the revenue. Simple math, if you multiply the two together, you get basically the revenue per class, right? Per classroom. That ends up being, in this case, $220,001.60 if you want to add that up. 
Now, if you look at the BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, in 2016, the median wage for a teacher in Texas was $55,800. That's the, the National Bureau of Labor Statistics. If you look at the NEA's own website, they say that teachers have about a 27% benefit load. All right, so let's get to total comp. That's uh, 55,800 times 1.27, or roughly 70,866 for a classroom teacher. So now, of course, you've got to turn your lights on, you've got to keep the heat on, you've got to make sure you pay your rent. So according to what I found out in Austin, the Aquila, you're, for, to do that, to pay for rent, light, heat, is basically $37 a square foot now. So the average class, uh, classroom size in Texas, according to the state, has to be 700 square feet. So again, let's add times those two together, basic math. You get to a point where your classroom cost uh, for just for square foot, $37 times the 700, 25,900. Right, so let's, let's walk our way up this now. We have a teacher and a classroom cost, so which is totaling, um, but now I'm gonna add, I'm gonna be nice. Let's add $1,000 per, per kid for expenses on books and paper and things like that. So that's another 20,800. So now you've got what a teacher costs, what the classroom costs, and what the, the extra spending would be. That totals 117,566. Someone want to tell me where the other 100,000 went? Part of this conversation about school financing has to be about how and where we spend money. Now, of course, the danger of an analogy like that is, is you don't cross a river just because the average depth is four feet, right? And so it's really important for you to realize about the statistics are just averages. And so you have to look at every single state. But I think the first thing you want to talk about when you talk about school financing is understanding. People want to understand how the funds are spent. For example, people understand, want to understand why student spending in America went up 27% between 1992 and 2014, but teacher salaries went down 2% in this conversation. People want to understand why student enrollment went up 20% nationally, but, but percent of all other non-teaching staff went up 47% or more than double. People want to understand in Texas why enrollment went up 17% between 2000 and 1992 and 2014, but teacher salaries only went up 1%. They want to understand why enrollment in Texas schools went up 48%, so you're growing. That sounds exciting. Um, a lot of money coming out of that. But teachers went up, number of teachers went up 56%, and the number of non-teaching all other staff went up 68%. So I just want you to think for a second, you know that if, if the enrollment, if the teacher and non-teacher staff um, increases had just merely kept pace with the student enrollment, right, at 48%, you would be able to save enough money to give 270,311 children an $8,000 ESA, education savings gap. I just want you to think of the scale of these conversations when you look at them. All right, so now we've gone over a thought exercise. People want to understand this data. They want to understand what's going on and how it's being used. They also want clarity, right, and transparency. Anyone ever tried to go find out how the school funding formula in Texas works? <laughs> Anyone run to the website like I did last night? Wow, that's fun at midnight to start going down each, each chart and having it be very convoluted. Now, there are some of us who think maybe that's intentional. But one of the questions we need is clarity and transparency. For example, if you look at the data that the state has given to the federal government uh, from the NCS, so the state reports, uh, the districts report to the state, the state reports to the feds. Often, what you'll find is what the state reports to the feds is different from what the state reports to legislators, in both in terms of revenue numbers, budget numbers, enrollment numbers, all sorts of things. And I'll give you an example of that. But the per pupil revenues in K-12 education in Texas, according to what you have given to the federal government in 2014-15, were 10,724 per student. But expenditures during that same year were 9,051. So now we're talking about budget to actual again, right? So you can talk about, I, I run a business where my board gives me bonuses if I'm, uh, or punishes me if I'm outside of 5% variant between the two. How much do you want to think we're variant on budget to actual in K-12 education? Significant amounts, right? And so part of the conversation about clarity of school funding formulas 
have to be about how you show these kind of numbers in simple ways. I know, I know a lot of us care about three numbers when we actually are looking at uh, supporting someone. How much they have on hand, how much they plan to spend, how much have they spent, and how much they have left. So there's got to be ways to have that conversation about clarity. But this all leads, of course, to customization. The trend in education reform is customization. And I think that's also the trend in school financing. So you may not know this, but 58% of Americans, according to what we found, already are choosing in some way, whether through a housing choice, or a charter school, or a magnet school, or a private school fee paying, or private school scholarship. Already there's choosing. 40% of Americans are choosing non-residentially already. So you have a significant chunk of people who are doing it and they want to customize. We just did a report in Florida of the Education Savings Account program there last night. Uh, it was released yesterday. 42% of the families who received an education savings account, guess what? Customized. They paid some for teachers and some for schools and some for instructional materials. This is what's happening in America. People want more individualization and customization. Can anyone say Amazon or Instacart or everything we use to customize our lives? So I think this is important for us to recognize those three things, right? Understanding what's actually being done and said with school financing. And I'm not an expert in Texas. I am in Indiana. But I, you need to understand that. Clarity on how and, and what it's used for and transparency and equality of data. And then I would argue customization. So let me give you three examples from my home state. So we're in the midst of fighting a billion dollar referendum of one of our school districts inside of our city. And I, I went and looked up what they report to the state and what the state reports to the feds. And what you might have imagined is I got three wholly different sets of numbers. Right, so the district reports that they spend $577 million, the state reported that they spent $560 million, and the feds reported they spent almost 600. million. Which one's right? Or there's got to be some way to figure this out, right, because this is the age of being able to customize data. So data matters and how we use data, number one. Number two, what we did in Indiana was unique. Um, in 2007, after a, few, a number of years of, of fighting on this, basically you should know that, the, as, as you heard, local and property tax shares have changed over years, right? In 1920, does anyone want to tell me how many people, uh, what percentage of the revenues were from the federal government? Zero. How much were from the local? 85% basically. And the rest were from the state. 1970, you want to tell me what those numbers is? The first year after the DO, Department of Education was established? 8% straight feds, right up. 39.9% state and 52.1% local. Today, those numbers nationally are 9% federal, 46% state, and 45% local. So you've seen what, what Senator Taylor, a, a clear moving towards state and local being roughly equal across the country. And that's sort of, that's very close to being true here. So one of the challenges that we found is how to find property tax and clarify its use. So when we passed property tax reform in Indiana, we actually stopped the local property tax from being used for anything except, anything for education except debt resurfacing capital, and transportation. So everything else, general operating fund, went to the state of Indiana's coffers. What that allowed us to do is have a much more per-student conversation, a customizing conversation. It allowed us to say how much is the state actually spending in operational and instructional dollars to educate a child without having to play with the local property share issue. And so, you know, the, 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 the people don't want to realize this, but we did put a half cent on state sales tax in order to achieve that. But people also got a property cap, uh, tax cap at 1% of assessed value, which is wonderful if you live there. Um, so what the impact of that was in Indiana was to be able to allow us to not only open up every public school district to choice, because now the largest choice program in, in Indiana is the public to public transfer program. 60,000 families already go across districts free of charge. Well, free of charge to the locals, but the states, the dollars follow the kids to the state, to the school. And that's the key. Um, and the last thing I would say, because of that, you have impact on choice that's high. And we've been allowed to, uh, able to customize it gets down to student-centered funding, which is what you'll hear from Aaron and others. So thank you very much. Thank you,
Well, thank you for having me. I'm going to put my school teacher hat on today a little bit and talk as I uh, talk through a couple of school finance concepts. Um, wait for my, so the first uh, thing I always like to, to start with is to put things in perspective and that uh, our system is huge. Uh, and um, I'm not just quoting our president on that, but it really is huge. Uh, he would agree with me in that we're, when we're talking about $48 billion and 5.4, approaching 5.5 billion million students um, in over 1,000 school districts and charter schools and the like, any time that you try to affect change in a system that large, you have to start talking about making changes to the tune of a billion, billions of dollars or it's a ripple in the pond. So um, one of the reasons that we have uh, such a complex system is because our state is so uh, large and diverse, and we have a lot of uh, diverse needs throughout our state. So I like to talk about the fact that when I fly on an airplane, I don't understand how it works. Uh, I don't have to understand how it works. I need it to get me to one, from one place to another safely and efficiently. And we need a system of school funding that accomplishes our goals and gets us where we want to go as a state. I don't think that everybody in the state has to understand it because what we lose sometimes when we oversimplify things is that we have a plane that crashes. Uh, and that's what I don't want to see happen with our system. So while that is uh, cumbersome and hard to deal with the complexities, uh, we're going to talk through some of the reasons why those complexities are there in our system and I think need to remain in our system to some degree. Uh, and talking a little bit about um, whether or not uh, equitable means equal. Uh, so I uh, became a foster parent to two sisters this past fall. One of them is eight and one of them is a teenager. And any of you in the room who uh, are parents of teenagers or have been parents of teenagers, uh, I think will agree with me that teenagers are expensive. Uh, I learned this the hard way as I went to go try to buy them some clothing. And the eight-year-old's clothes cost a lot less than the teenagers. And so do her shoes and the Christmas gifts that she wanted. So the same can be said for a lot of the students in our schools. And that's what I, the takeaway I hope that you get from that is not just that teenagers are expensive, but that different students in our system cost different amounts. And we have to have a system that recognizes that in different amounts and that uh, sometimes equitable doesn't mean equal. If we have the same, and I'll talk louder over that. Uh, <laughs> I can use my teacher voice. Uh, so if we have the same amount in one class as we do in another, or one student in another, that doesn't mean that's what that student needs. So we need to fund to those needs to provide an equity of opportunity, not just equal amounts of funding. And that shouldn't be our goal, is to just have those numbers match. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, I would talk to you a little bit about why we have so many complex facets of our system. And, and as this, uh, the Texas Commission on Public School Finance is meeting, uh, and they're talking about and considering, do we really need all of these? Are these necessary and, and right to have in our system? Right now, we have adjustments for district characteristics. Uh, the cost of education index, which is supposed to recognize the differences in cost of living in uh, different districts. Um, I'll say right now that that one hasn't been updated since 1991. Uh, that's back when Frisco was farmland. So the cost of living is a little bit different there uh, now than it was back then. Uh, Austin was a sleepy university town with a very relatively low cost of living. Not so anymore. So we have a system that makes adjustments for some things that are very out of date. Um, size is one of those things in that uh, the economies of scale that are recognized when you hit a certain amount as in terms of um, you can have a staff for 20, a teacher for 20 students or you can have a, a teacher for 10 because that's all the second graders that you have in that district. So there are some diseconomies of scale that exist that we try to make up for with those adjustments. Same as sparsity when you have kids that are riding a bus for an hour one way and an hour back, uh, making some adjustments and allowances for that. And then you have student characteristics. And we recognize that, as I was mentioning earlier with my different age kiddos, um, that there are some characteristics amongst students that cost different amounts. Uh, when you're teaching a student who is um, new to this country English, and they're not hearing English at home, and the only place they're hearing English is at school, it's more costly uh, to educate. For one, you have to uh, usually pay a premium to get a bilingual teacher to, to work with that student. So all those things, uh, career and technical education is more costly to provide. All those things get factored in, into our system. And if we actually um, had these adjusted and updated, I think that equity would look very different in our state. 
Because one of the, uh, the things about chasing equity right now is that we are in some ways chasing false equity by trying to make numbers match in a system that's woefully out of date. And in some of these weights and adjustments for student characteristics, uh, they were arbitrary to begin with. So um, we need to update those to truly reflect and make sure that we are delivering what students truly need and that we give them an equity of opportunity. I would argue that um, and I represent those districts that pay recapture or Robin Hood. I don't think Houston ISD would be paying recapture if these uh, elements in our system were updated to truly reflect what those costs are and what it costs to educate a student in poverty. Uh, they wouldn't be sending money back to the state to be redistributed elsewhere if we were truly funding um, what some of those costly students need in that district. Uh, you're going to see a repeat here of the scatter plot that Senator Taylor shared with us earlier. Uh, this was, uh, again, as, as he said, from, from uh, former Supreme Court Justice Enoch, uh, used with the Texas uh, Commission on Public School Finance at their first meeting to talk about the fact that um, school districts in Texas are all over the board. And, and, and that when he used this, this, this data from 2011, that um, couldn't make sense of whether or not uh, more spending uh, drove performance. So I updated the concept um, with using the data from 1516 because I agree with Senator Taylor that we want to use actual data whenever possible. Uh, so this isn't the most recent. We do have 1617 um, uh, data, but it's not actual. So this is 1516, uh, looking at the differences when you spend more that you, uh, this trend line shows that we have our, our schools achieving more. Uh, does that apply to everybody? Nope. As you can see, we're always going to have people that fall into different quadrants. But what I hope we can learn from this is that there are lessons to be learned. That some of the districts that are spending less and achieving more, what can we learn from those districts and apply elsewhere? And for those districts that are spending more and achieving less, what can we fix in those districts to make them more effective with students and more efficient with their dollars? And then the other thing I hope that we learn from this scatter plot, because honestly, scatter plots aren't my favorite way to learn. <laughs> Uh, I think they oversimplify a very complex concept. But what, the other thing that I hope that we look at and pay attention to is, let's see if I can be as cool as Senator Taylor with a laser pointer too. Yeah, no Star Wars, but I got later lasers. We have outliers in our system, and we're going to have outliers in our system. For one thing, I don't think that in a, a state as large and diverse as Texas, we can afford to bring in every outlier. So we have to reach the point where rough equity, as some people have called it, is okay and that uh, we have to look into the stories behind why do we have outliers in each of these quadrants? What's going on in those districts? What's actually behind those numbers? And are we okay with that? Or is there something that we should do to change our system and make it different? And that's a judgment call that um, those on the commission and, and those of us uh, in this room who care about this issue have to make. Because uh, we need, a formulas and a system that provides opportunities for all students, including, and maybe we need to change what adjustments we make in our system, but uh, we want to make sure that uh, we have a system that is properly serving students in severe poverty. We want them to have uh, every opportunity to have that American dream of achieving and going to college and having that career as a student who's not living in poverty. Uh, we want to address the needs of our English language learners, our students with disabilities and needs. We want to make sure that they are getting the services that they need to be successful, and we have to figure out what that costs. So the good news is there are experts out there who can tell us exactly what those cost, cost differentials are. And maybe there are some that we are funding um, inappropriately and need to put that funding elsewhere, and maybe there are some that are inadequately funded now that need to have other funding directed there. But if we have a system that truly meets the needs of our population, we need to know these things and be able to look at research-based methods. And we have the data. That's the beauty of this. Uh, when Senator Taylor talked about some of these changes being put into place in 1989, uh, some of them date back to 1984, some of these weights, um, we didn't have the data then that we have now. And we have the information available to us. We just need to put it to use to make sure that our system is designed in a manner that meets the needs of our students. So uh, we need that to address that. We need to address the differences in the cost of living. All that information exists. We need the political will to adopt a system that makes sure that we are getting the resources where they need to go. And we need to have a system that uh, it has a reasonable and economically viable tax burden with which to fund it. Uh, one thing I'll say about schools is I, I often say, um, 
if we don't pay for them now, we will pay later uh, in other ways that are, are less desirable. And um, you know, we, we talked a lot about property taxes. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about property taxes. Uh, and that's another judgment call to be made. Is that the best way to fund our schools or is there a better way? And then the other the last uh, tenant I'll, I'll mention that I think is very important and should be a priority for this state is local control. A local control over the school district so that our districts can make decisions regarding tax rates, regarding uh, programs and things that they provide in that community so that the local school can re represent and reflect the community's values. Um, I often say that I don't think taxpayers are any more informed than when it comes to casting a vote that has to do with their pocketbook. So taxpayers are, uh, and voters are really informed when it comes to whether or not their tax rate's going to go up, whether they're going to approve a bond, to take on local debt, and those things. And I, I get really frustrated with those who, who um, disregard that and say that voters are not informed from making those decisions. I would argue that they are. And if they're not, they certainly should be. Those decisions are important. So um, Senator Taylor also talked about that uh, the the complaints that have come about the, the diminishing state share of um, public school funding. And there are many ways that you can calculate this. Uh, this is the 38% that was put out by the Legislative Budget Board and the way that they have calculated that historically, but we can certainly calculate that in a different way. I think what you'll see though is that the trend line remains the same. I'm not even here this morning to cast judgment on whether that trend line is a good or a bad thing. But we do have to consider that um, as the state share of funding for the foundation school program goes down, the local taxpayer, the, the local property taxpayers share of funding goes up. So is that the way we want to fund our schools or do we want to look at other ways to, uh, to do things? Are there alternative revenue sources besides local property taxes? Maybe that's something we want to explore as a state. Uh, but right now, the bottom line is that as the state share diminishes, for what it costs to fund our foundation school program, local property taxpayers are paying more. And why that matters to my guys, real quickly, my last point here, is that recapture is continuing to rise. And so as that burden is shifted more and more to the local property taxpayer, we see taxpayers in uh, certain communities who are having to bear even more of that burden because the values in their communities continue to rise and so do their tax bills. So that's, uh, those are the main things I wanted to, to touch on uh, I applaud the work of the Texas School Finance Commission and uh, know that they have uh, some tough road ahead of them and uh, we are grateful that you guys are interested in this topic and hope we can continue working together to make this system better. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me, me this morning. I'm very excited to, uh, to be here. I'll wait till my PowerPoint comes up. But let me just start by saying um, ditto to everything that Robert said earlier. If you're not familiar with um, Ed Choice's work, um, they have a great uh, uh, body of research around school choice policies, around school finance. Um, check out their stuff if you haven't already. It's really good. Um, so. There we go, okay. So I'm gonna start off with a statistic, and it's probably one that you've seen some variation of before. And that is that Texas ranks 49th in adjusted per pupil spending, with 49 being towards the bottom of the list. And it's 49 out of 51, with the 51st being DC and not Canada. And so, <laughs> And yeah, DC ranks way high up there on that list as well. Um, and so the question is, like, what does this actually mean? Because this is used as a reason that we need to increase funding, right? We rank 49th, we're Texas, we gotta get higher than that, that's unacceptable. Our outcomes are bad, so therefore we need to increase spending. So the question is, what does this actually tell us? And in my estimation, this data point alone doesn't tell us much. So if you look at NAEP scores and you go down this list here, you see uh, a lot of states that are spending a lot and not getting great results, and you see a lot of states that are spending not very much and getting really good results. And here are some examples. Um, Indiana, they rank 29th in spending in the country. Um, their fourth grade math NAEP results overall, um, they come in fourth, 
when you adjust and just look at um, free and reduced lunch students, they're actually first overall. On the opposite side of that, you have states like Connecticut and New York that spend a ton. Um, so for example, New York ranks third in overall per pupil spending, um, but ranks only 39th in overall NAEP scores, and when you just look at um, low-income students, they rank in abysmal 37th. And so what I get from this here is that it's not just the money that counts, it's the productivity, it's what you're doing with the money that is the most important. Okay, so another scatter plot right here. Oh my God. And this is actually, it becomes very interesting when you drill down and look at productivity uh, within a single school district. So all of these dots here, those are schools within Dallas ISD. Mm -hmm. And those are only low income schools with 85% or more low income students to try to have a rough apples to apples comparison. So on the y axis, you have fourth grade star math scores, the percent met, met standard in 2015, 2016. And on the x axis down there, you have operating expenditures per pupil. And so what trend do you see here in this scatter plot? You don't see a trend, right? It's just a bunch of, bunch of dots. But what becomes really interesting, and I hope you appreciate these lines because it took me like an hour and a half to figure out how to put them on. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I was using a very high tech and complicated software package called Paint and uh, it took me a little while. <laughs> but what's really interesting about this, if you look at the bottom right quadrant there, um, there are higher spending, lower performing schools. Then you look at the top left quadrant and there are lower spending, higher performing schools. And so we already know that a lot of schools, even within the same district, even with the same um, student characteristics, are getting different bang for the buck. Some are much more productive than others. And I did this with another data set. I only have 12 minutes, so I won't go through this, but this one adjusts for, um, for student characteristics. It's a little more sophisticated. Um, it's from the uh, texassmartschools.org and their data set, and you see the exact same trends in terms of, really, you're not seeing much relationship between um, spending and outcomes. But there are some real bright spots that are doing very well with the money they have. And of course, some schools that just aren't getting much for the money that they are spending, even though they're spending more. And so what can we conclude from this? Um, first, I'll say, this isn't to say that money doesn't matter at all, right? Mm -hmm. So logically speaking, if we were to decrease spending down to $1,000 per pupil, our outcomes will probably suffer, right? So we know money, money matters to some degree. Nobody's saying that money doesn't matter at all. Um, but there are two big takeaways. One, we're not maximizing productivity with current education dollars. And number two, more money allocated in the same manner is not going to improve outcomes. So throwing money at the schools that are already getting a lot, that aren't doing much with it, that's not gonna do much. And they're just as likely to get the new money as the other schools that are highly productive. And so how do we increase productivity? Well, one of the knee-jerk reactions is more top-down mandates, right? We, you know, best practices, evidence-based practices, whatever you might call them. Um, there are a lot of states and a lot of districts that have tried uh, many of these things and have failed miserably. California invested billions of dollars in class size reduction efforts that led to nothing. No better outcomes, but they spent billions of dollars on it. So the question is, what do we need to do? And here I have a picture of uh, Yes Prep Southwest in Houston. So I used to work for Yes Prep, and this was one of the first campuses that I visited. And as you can see, uh, this probably doesn't fit in the category of the schools that Senator Taylor was mentioning earlier. It's not a very nice school, so to speak. I was a little shocked the first time I saw it. In fact, it's actually literally just a bunch of trailers. Um, and so that's what it looks like. But inside those classrooms, you see amazing things happening. And it all comes down to one simple thing. It's the human element. And the human element cannot be dictated from the state. It can't be dictated from central offices. So if you met the staff there, um, they are absolutely obsessed with two things. Number one is talent, getting the best people on board. And by the way, it's not always the people with the most experience or the, the, the highest degrees. Um, getting the best people on board is number one. And number two is culture. It's all about culture and building culture and maintaining it and having a highly productive environment and just making excellence the source of everything. 
And so for me, there's no sil silver bullet in increasing productivity um, you know, ac across the entire state, but we do know that when you allow educators to spend dollars flexibly, when you give them the autonomy to make trade-offs in the classroom and at the school level, and you give parents robust choice to hold those educators accountable, you get better results. And so we know, we know those two combinations of, of things can work. And so the question here is, what funding system best supports these things? Flexibility for educators and, um, and parental choice. And for me, that is student-centered funding. So making students the focus of a school finance system and not districts. Um, Student-centered funding is based on four key principles. The first is equity. So you should fund students based on need regardless of, of where they live. The second is portability. So money attaches to the child and um, they can choose what school they go to, whether that is a, uh, a public, school, public neighborhood school, a school in another district, a charter school, or um, if we ever get one, a, a private school choice program like an education savings account. The third principle is transparency. So money should be delivered in a, a clear and transparent and easy to understand way um, that taxpayers can understand, which is more or less the complete opposite of our system right now. Robert, I think you had no hope in understanding our system in two hours last night no. on your laptop. Um, and the last principle is autonomy. So as I was talking about before, allowing principals and educators to make those complex trade-offs because, you know, just think for a moment, right? If you have a rigid class size mandate that says, you know, you have to have a ratio of 20 to one, well, what if you have an amazing teacher, right, who is knocking the ball out of the park and you wanna offer him or her an extra couple thousand dollars to take on more students? Why should you not have that flexibility when that will work? Or would you rather just hire uh, a teacher off the street who might be mediocre just so you can hit those class size mandates? So we know autonomy works. So there's probably a lot that I could talk about in terms of uh, reforming the, the school finance system. One is, as uh, Christy was, was, was mentioning earlier, is putting, uh, you know, allocating some of the, the money we already have toward that weighted student formula, towards uh, funding for student need, and towards the, uh, the base allotment. I agree with those. Um, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to go through three really quickly. So how to move the ball forward toward um, student-centered funding. So the first is to minimize the role of local property taxes. And so the problem, relying on local education dollars creates barriers to choice and funding equi equity. And so we've talked about equity a lot. Um, funding equity has been a problem, not just in Texas, but throughout the country uh, for over 100 years. And the root cause of this has been property taxes. And so I won't talk much about that right now, but what a lot of people don't understand is that local revenue can cause barriers to choice policies. Um, for example, charter schools. So in Texas, maintenance and operation funding doesn't flow seamlessly between charters and traditional public schools um, because their funding for m and is based on statewide averages. And as you guys know, facilities funding as well is, is problematic because charters get very little facilities funding for their, uh, for their schools. So that's problematic. For open enrollment policies, so students going from, are going to an out-of-district school, um, maintenance and operation funding doesn't always follow students across district boundaries. It's dependent upon things like property wealth and um, local tax rates in terms of how much money they're, they're, they're going to receive. And so literally the same student in one district, if they go to another district down the street, which might be just a few miles away, they're actually going to be funded at different levels. They're not gonna get the same amount of money. And the third, which fortunately in Texas, I don't think we have too much to worry about. I'm, I'm not an attorney, so um, don't quote me on that, but uh, local revenues cause a lot of problems with choice, with private school choice in other states. And so things like vouchers and education savings accounts. Um, in a state like Mississippi, constitutionally, not one local dollar can be used to fund um, these programs. And so you start getting into these, these legal issues um, as well as efficiency and, um, and that and at the heart of it are the local revenues. So moving the ball forward, um, so Robert being here was, uh, was very timely um, because I think one thing the commission and legislators should look at is Indiana's funding model and in particular their move away from um, local revenues. The other big thing, this might be the, the, the shock of the century right here, um, if I'm allowed to say this, but we should actually look at California's funding model. 
Um, California doesn't rely much on local property taxes. And they enacted some really good um, allocation reforms back in 2013 with their uh, local control funding formula, um, where they streamlined things that got rid of a lot of categorical grants that had strings attached to them and, um, you know, kind of shackled the hands of, uh, of principals. And so those are two funding formulas that we should really look at. And my time is up, so I'm going to take two quick minutes, hopefully, and just uh, breeze through this. But one other thing that we really need to look at is how districts allocate funding at the district level. Um, one, it causes a lot of inequities in terms of um, their, their, their practices. And um, two, it actually seizes control um, from principals to the district level. And it does this because of the way they allocate funds to, um, to principals. So instead of giving them money to spend flexibly, they're given staffing positions that principals may or may not want. And a typical school principal has only uh, about one to 5% discretion over their, their school's funds, which is nothing. And so moving the ball forward here, um, the commission should certainly look at district funding practices and the practice of FTE budgeting and look towards cities like Boston, um, Denver, and New Orleans, which have made fundamentals, fundamental reforms to empower principals and to make funding more portable and, um, and equitable. And certainly districts themselves should also look towards these changes. And lastly, my last recommendation, this is very low hanging fruit. Um, right now we have one of the best financial reporting systems in the country. It's awesome. Other states are light years behind us. Um, but there's, there are a lot of ways that we can make this reporting system better. And so the good news is we have all the infrastructure. We're already reporting out on financial data. Um, but there's ways to make it better. There's ways to tie education dollars at the school level to productivity. And there's way to, ways to tie um, what schools are supposed to receive from the district versus what they actually receive. And so there are a few states out there that we can look toward. Um, and again, I think this is very low hanging fruit um, in terms of um, a possibility for the next session. And so with that, I will turn it over for uh, Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much. Where is our uh, mic? All right. Is there a question? A question right, right here. Just some comments. Uh, my name is Ann Tai. I'm a um, trustee with the Austin Independent School District, and I'm a retired middle school teacher, 27 years in the eighth grade. Would you please speak into the mic, please? Okay. So my name is Ann Tai. I'm a district trustee with the Austin Independent School District, and a retired middle school teacher, 27 years in the eighth grade. Just some comments. When you talk about customizing and choice, that's another term for segregation. Be very careful could, about could that. Could you get to a question, please? No, I don't have a question. I have okay. comments. Let's go to another question. Thank then. you so much for allowing me my time for free speech. Yeah. Well, can we well, just yeah, I'm that? happy to address some yeah. of those questions because we already have a segregated system of schooling. It's called property tax. And in fact, what ends up happening, what ends up ha hold on. I would love to hear and spend a lot of time on this, but we know, example, the, the data from Harvard is that we have a more segregated public school system than ever since Brown v. Board. We also know from data from Harvard that choice programs like voucher programs are leading to a more integrated school system. That's the data. We, uh, our time is up. Uh, we have to get out of here at 1045. Uh, we had to start late because of our lunch, our breakfast speakers. Uh, if you would thank our panel for their uh, participation today. Thank you.